Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. It's a plan. A new group emerges to help pregnancy centers prepare for a post-Roe world. Running for president, we speak one-on-one -on -one with Brian Carroll. He's the 2020 presidential nominee you probably haven't heard of, representing the American Solidarity Party, which boasts to be pro-life for whole life. And Unpregnant, a new HBO movie chronicles a teenage abortion road trip. We speak out. The pro-life movement is preparing for a post-Roe world by establishing a new network called PLAN. PLAN, which stands for the Pregnancy and Life Assistance Network, facilitates collaboration between assistance programs and their communities. The goal is to build an infrastructure that empowers women and families by providing medical, social, and material support. The project, still in its early stages, comes as there's greater anticipation surrounding the possibility Roe versus Wade may soon be overturned. Pro-lifers recognize with the possibility of abortion being illegal in our nation, there will be an even greater need to serve and support pregnant women and their children. The Atlantic publication announced this plan project in a piece last week. The Atlantic's Emma Green writes, quote, in theory, it's an ambitious effort to find common ground between hardcore anti-abortion rights activists and people who want to help pregnant women but may not be convinced that abortion should be completely banned. Joining us now via Skype are two leaders of PLAN. Cheney Mullins is the PLAN program manager and Jill Stanick is the PLAN community outreach manager. She previously worked as a nurse in the labor and delivery department. Thank you both for coming onto the show. Cheney, can you explain what will PLAN do that does not already exist in the pro-life movement? Thank you, Catherine. The pro-life movement and faith communities have already been faithfully serving women and families for decades, and we want to highlight their excellent work. You can imagine all these service providers as dots, not just the pregnancy centers, but all kinds of charities serving those medical material and social needs. And what PLAN is doing is connecting those dots, mm -hmm. making a more complete picture so that the providers know about each other and so that the communities and churches can know about the providers and get more involved. Jill, if and when Roe v. Wade is overturned, are pregnancy centers prepared and ready to care for pregnant women in need? Catherine, pregnancy centers already outnumber abortion clinics in the U.S. three to one, mm -hmm. and federally subsidized health centers outnumber Planned Parenthoods by 20 to one. So we have a, a good start, but we must also know that there's seven primary reasons that moms seek abortions. So we are working to address all of those reasons in addition to pregnancy health and community health. Jill, as a pro-life leader yourself, how close do you believe we are to overturning Roe v. Wade? Well, as Marjorie said in that article you mentioned at the beginning of the show, we believe we are coming close to a world where Roe v. Wade is going to be unrecognizable because it has been cut up to such a great extent or it will be overturned. So we must continue to bulk up the Supreme Court and that is gonna be done if we reelect our pro-life president and hold on to the Senate. And when Roe is overturned, 30 states stand ready to make abortion immediately illegal or eminently make it illegal. So many in the pro-life movement are hopeful that we're gonna be living in a post-Roe America sooner rather than later. Cheney, from your healthcare background, if and when Roe v. Wade is overturned, what will be the biggest gap when it comes to serving women in need and how will PLAN play a role in filling that gap? I would say anecdotally, based on countless conversations with service providers, there's a real gap in terms of housing and pro-life prenatal care. PLAN really hopes to work with the communities, inspiring them and helping them strategize how to fill these gaps. But we know also that needs vary from mother to mother, and that's why PLAN's directory is truly comprehensive, 
full of life affirming resources to answer all the reasons why women get abortions. And she might be facing really difficult situations like domestic violence, addiction, or even trafficking. And over 50% of moms that seek abortions already have a child or more at home. And she might be thinking, how can I feed this child and my mm -hmm. other kids? We want to help her meet her needs and assuage her fears. Jill, the abortion issue is incredibly divisive and is a political lightning rod. Is there an opportunity here at Plan to bring together people who disagree on abortion but do agree on helping women in need? Absolutely, Catherine. Plan is a non-political initiative, and I can think of two great examples already to answer a question. And one is a church that is part of our extended network that belongs to a pro-abortion denomination, but they really want to help women and be a part of what we do. And then another is a legal center that doesn't take a stand on abortion, but sees a lot of immigrant pregnant mothers and so is thankful for the resources that we can provide to them and want to be a part of what we do too. Mm. Cheney, the CDC recently released a report that finds Hispanic and non-Hispanic black pregnant women appear to be disproportionately affected by COVID-19 during pregnancy. How will PLAN take minority women's health into consideration and work to curb the disparity in health care that minority women do experience? Catherine, one reason for this major health disparity is a tragic lack of prenatal care. Mm. And as PLAN inventories life-affirming doctors who really listen, really care about empowering minority women and partnering with them for the sake of their health, we'll publicize where these women can find these providers, where they can go for free or discount care. And this should drastically improve outcomes for both moms and babies. What we don't want to find is a Planned Parenthood in a minority community, mm -hmm. but no life-affirming clinic or option, because we know abortion is the leading cause of death in the Black community. And why is this? We must ask. It's often because minority women don't feel supported. They don't feel like they have enough resources to be a successful mom. And that plan directory will give churches and assistance providers the tools they need to give that woman concrete help. Jill, what kind of insight can the pro-life movement gain from PLAN and its work as it continues to grow? Well, as a former nurse who comforted an abortion survivor, I've witnessed firsthand the vital importance of the pro-life Americans stepping up to protect both unborn babies and babies who've been born as well as their moms. So PLAN is answering the questions of what happens when abortion is not an option, when it's illegal or unthinkable, and hopefully both. And all of the pro-life activists have had their heads down for so long, working so hard to stop abortion. And we're saying that that time is drawing near. And so it's also time for us to start thinking past that. And it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of hard work for the pro-life movement after Roe is mm -hmm. overturned. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll never stop, really. And Jamie, real quick, what regions does PLAN provide help, and how can a family in need find more information? PLAN's active right now in Georgia and Northern Virginia, and you can visit our website at planforher.org. We hope to spread this model to many more states. We hope you will explore our directory of resources. And even if you don't live in Northern Virginia, we've listed national service providers on the margins so that anyone can find help. Excellent. Well, thank you both for joining us. Jill Stanick, Plan Community Outreach Manager and Cheney Mullins, Plan Program Manager. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. The Save Moms and Babies Act would prevent the FDA from approving new chemical abortion drugs, put an end to labeling changes for existing drugs, and stop abortionists from dispensing these drugs remotely. If made into law, this bill would stop the expansion of chemical abortions, which are on the rise today. This Save Moms and Babies Act is a common sense bill that would protect both women and unborn children. And that brings us to this week's Call to Action. 
go to ProLifeWeekly.com to urge your senator to co-sponsor the Save Moms and Babies Act to protect unborn babies and their mothers from dangerous chemical abortions. When you fill in your information, you'll see we drafted letters that you can send straight to your senators. Again, the Save Moms and Babies Act is common sense legislation that would stop the expansion of chemical abortions, protecting both women and unborn children. Urge your senator to support the Save Moms and Babies Act by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. He is not President Donald Trump, he is not former Vice President Joe Biden, but he is running for President of the United States in 2020. Brian Carroll is the presidential nominee for the American Solidarity Party. The third party was created back in 2011. It does not have recognized ballot access in many states yet. And while it is not explicitly religious, the American Solidarity Party platform is based on the principles of Catholic social teaching, solidarity, subsidiarity, and distributism. The party boasts of being, quote, whole life. In its party platform on life, the American Solidarity Party states, quote, our party is founded on an unwavering commitment to defend life and to promote policies that safeguard the intrinsic dignity of the human person from conception until natural death. Brian Carroll, the 2020 presidential nominee for the American Solidarity Party, joins us now via Skype. Brian, welcome to the show. This may be the first time many of our viewers are hearing of you and of the American Solidarity Party. Can you first introduce yourself and ASP? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I am a retired school teacher. I taught for over 40 years most of it in junior high and most of it in California, but I also taught nine years uh, on a mission station in Columbia, South America, and I taught a summer in China. And uh, I joined the party in uh, 2016. Uh, like so many other voters, I looked at what the choices were and I said, there's gotta be something else. And uh, it took me about two weeks of poking around on the web and I found the American Solidarity Party. And I said, yeah, this is it. I had no idea that I would be the nominee uh, four years later. Brian, I know you are evangelical Christian, but your vice presidential candidate, Amar Patel, is Catholic. And I understand the American Solidarity Party uses the concept of Catholic social teaching as a foundation for the party. Can you expand on that? Yeah, when I party, I had to ask people CST stood for, um, but when I read Form, not knowing anything about Catholic social teaching, I looked at, at plank after plank after plank, and I said, yeah, this is, this is what I believe in. Mm -hmm. So although I came in a kind of a roundabout way, uh, I am absolutely sold on the platform and uh, the Catholic social teaching behind it. Can you walk us through your party's platform when it comes to the life issue? What does the American Solidarity Party mean when saying it is a whole life party? It, it means that we are uh, in, we respect every human being uh, from conception uh, through natural death. We oppose uh, abortion. We oppose assisted suicide. We oppose capital punishment. Uh, we support the kinds of programs that makes it easier uh, for a woman who is stressed out about a pregnancy to look forward with confidence and say, yeah, I can deliver this baby and I have a, a good chance of raising it successfully. So to clarify, can you expand on the party's stance on the death penalty? Uh, yeah, we don't believe uh, the death penalty is necessary. Uh, in, in previous times, when, when you had uh, people who needed to be removed from society, there was less opportunity to put them in a safe place. Today we can do that. And there's no reason that we need to be uh, killing a person to protect society. Uh, they can be uh, in a place where they have a chance uh, for spiritual conversion, uh, to be redeemed. Uh, they, they are less expensive to society. Capital punishment costs a whole lot more than just putting somebody away for life. Do you view racism as a life issue? Yes. 
uh, anything that causes one group of people or individuals to be valued as less than others for something as artificial as racism uh, has got to change. And one of the things about capital punishment is it is used against minorities uh, way disproportionate to the way it's used against whites. Brian, during his time as president, Donald Trump has expanded the Mexico City policy, created a new office for conscience protection at the HHS department, enacted the Protect Life rule, has made strong pro-life appointments in key administrative positions. He was the first president to speak at the March for Life and has made other pro-life achievements. Why shouldn't pro-lifers vote to keep President Trump in office in 2020? One thing that he hasn't done is treated individuals with respect. For example, those arriving at our border who are leaving horrendous situations, uh, most of them have experienced uh, the murder of a relative. Uh, they are fleeing the violence uh, in, in Central America oftentimes. Um, and they are not given any respect when they arrive at our border. They're treated as criminals. They're not criminals. Uh, they're refugees. They have been driven away from their home. Nobody leaves home uh, if, if there's not a violent reason pushing them away. And they need to be treated with respect. We need to treat uh, everybody with respect. And, uh, and that's one area where he has not. When he separates families at the borders, that to me is not pro-life. Brian, Pew Research reported this year that about three in 10 or more Democrats and Republicans do not agree with their party on abortion. What is your message then to pro-life Democrats considering the party's extreme abortion platform and that Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden has said he would codify Roe and would repeal the Hyde Amendment? Not only, not only that, but his choice yesterday of Kamala Harris as his vice president she is the, the most extreme uh, of all the uh, candidates on abortion. Uh, she made her mark here in California uh, during her difficult um, race for the Senate a few years back. That was when she chose, she, she conspired uh, with Planned Parenthood uh, to raid uh, David Daladen and Sandra Merritt. Uh, early in the morning to confiscate uh, their, their papers and their tapes and now charge them. They have been on trial now ever since. Uh, various legal uh, difficulties created by her arrest. Uh, you know, they charged that the, the tapes had been doctored and a court looked at them and said, no, these have not been doctored. These are honest. They've charged them under a law that was uh, has never been applied to journalists before. It was actually created to protect uh, journalists that might go undercover, especially in the um, slaughterhouse businesses. Uh, and so they've charged them with, with these crimes that it's just, it's a kangaroo court. And she did that. She was the one that started that. And so mm -hmm. as Biden picks her as his vice president, um, you know, there's, there's, you cannot, be pro-life and be comfortable in the Democratic Party. Mm. Uh, they, you know, they, they primaried Dan Lipinski and got him out. And they, they uh, I don't remember the fellow's name, but a longtime legislator uh, in Tennessee, I believe, uh, that they, they pushed him off the ballot. Uh, you know, you cannot be right. comfortable in the Democratic Party anymore if Brian. you are pro-life. I need to ask a question that I believe a lot of people are wondering. Perhaps there are viewers who agree with your party platform and recognize that you have very little name recognition, that you are not on the ballot on every state, and frankly, that you're not going to win the presidential election. Is a vote for you a wasted vote? If you vote for something you don't want and you win, have you really won? Better, I think, to vote for something you want and not get it, fall short. And I, I believe, you know, God can do anything. Um, I don't know what he's working here. But in the long run, one of the things that our goal is, we want to come out of this election 
uh, as a much stronger party. And, you know, we're already looking ahead to 2024 uh, and congressional races in 2022. Uh, we're in the process of building a party that we think can be a major American party. That's our goal. Well, we are so grateful that you took the time to join us and introduce yourself and the American Solidarity Party to our viewers. Brian Carroll, the 2020 presidential candidate for the American Solidarity Party. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Here at EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, we would love to extend an invitation to both President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden to discuss the pro-life issue. Coming up, HBO prepares to release an abortion movie. We speak out about the movie Unpregnant, which chronicles a teenage abortion road trip. week on August 14th, the Catholic Church celebrates the feast day of St. Maximilian Kolbe. The Polish Franciscan priest died at the Auschwitz concentration camp in 1941 and is remembered as a martyr of charity for dying in place of another prisoner who had a wife and children. He is the patron saint of the pro-life movement. St. Maximilian Kolbe, pray for us. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. An upcoming road trip comedy film features a disappointing destination, an abortion facility. That is this week's Speak Out segment. <music> Entertainment Weekly recently published an exclusive look at the upcoming HBO Max film called Unpregnant. The movie, based on a young adult novel of the same name, follows two teenagers who go on a road trip from Missouri to New Mexico to end up at an abortion facility. The film follows the story of Veronica, an ambitious high schooler faced with an unexpected pregnancy. Feeling like she cannot turn to her family or boyfriend for help, Veronica and a friend travel more than 900 miles to Albuquerque so she can legally undergo an abortion without parental consent. The film's director Rachel Lee Goldenberg told Entertainment Weekly, quote, I want there to be less shame and stigma around the topic of abortion. I want to educate people on the problematic existing laws and also demystify the abortion procedure. I'm not sure if one movie can do everything I want it to do, but it's not going to stop us from trying. Entertainment Weekly described Unpregnant as an abortion comedy, but there is nothing funny about this storyline. A teenage girl trekking across the country to secretly end the life of her unborn child is heartbreaking. And the truth is, contrary to the movie title, abortion does not magically make you unpregnant. It is a life-ending procedure that leaves a trail of destruction in its wake. Abortion is not entertainment, it is a tragedy. It's been one month since the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the Little Sisters of the Poor yet again. For this week's Pro-Life Focus, we check in with the Little Sisters after their most recent victory and see how they continue to stay on mission. I think the overall uh, feeling was just relief that, you know, it was over, that we won, an, you know, another time and that we can go back to, to doing the work that we do of caring for the elderly. Sister Constance V is a communications director for and religious sister of the Little Sisters of the Poor. Her religious order, founded by St. Jean Jagan, makes it their mission to care for the elderly poor, frequently at the bedside, tending to and praying for people who would otherwise die alone. And now Sister Constance is grateful she can focus on that powerfully merciful vocation instead of a Supreme Court distraction. After so many years of fighting for the soul of their ministry, they, they have the protection once more from the Supreme Court. Monsi Alvarado is the vice president and executive director of Beckett, the law firm which represented the Little Sisters at the High Court. The sisters objected to the Affordable Care Act's contraceptive mandate, which requires employers to pay for contraceptive drugs in their employee health care plans. But this strikes against the heart on the church's teachings, the very church these women have made lifelong vows for. The Supreme Court took up the case and heard oral arguments on it over the phone this spring. We will hear arguments first this morning in case number 19431, 
Little Sisters of the Poor versus Pennsylvania and the consolidated case. And after nearly a decade of a long legal battle, the high court ruled in favor of the Little Sisters in a 7-2 to two decision last month. Now that the Supreme Court has protected them for the second time, the Little Sisters' legal future, Alvarado says, looks bright. They've already won this in court against those who would already be threatening them. And the arguments that were brought by the state level officials have already lost. And so they're bringing their second tier arguments to the table. And what that means is no matter what comes against them, this Supreme Court is going to protect them. It has protected them before, and I'm confident that they would protect them in the future. Unfortunately, a group of Catholic religious sisters caring for the elderly poor has become a partisan issue in the 2020 political climate. Following their high court victory, former Vice President Joe Biden, the Democratic presidential candidate and Catholic politician, said he would end the Little Sisters exemption if he were to be elected president. A July statement released by his campaign stated, quote, if I am elected, I will restore the Obama-Biden policy that existed before the Supreme Court 2014 Hobby Lobby ruling, providing an exemption for houses of worship and an accommodation for nonprofit organizations with religious missions. But Sister Constance is holding on to her constant faith in God and staying on mission. During this pandemic, we're more aware than ever of what we're really all about. Our foundress started the congregation by carrying a homeless elderly woman home on her back and giving her her own bed and caring for her. And so, um, you know, all down through our history of 175 year history, we've been there for the elderly poor. Our charism is not to go into their homes and care for them or really to do like street ministry. Our charism has always been to offer them a home with us where they'll be welcomed as Christ and cared for really as members of our family. We take them as our parents or grandparents until God calls them home to himself. I am so grateful for the Little Sisters' work and how they uphold the dignity of life through all life stages. That does it for this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.